Let's stand, let's just sing holy ground. Brother Jim Cabez, would you do this prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we come here today, Lord, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, Lord. Just thank you for each one that's here for attendance this morning, dear God, Lord. Thank you for our Sunday school hour. Lord, we just praise you, Lord. We just love you. Thank you for answering our prayers with Brother Buck's concern, dear God, Lord. And God, we just ask you to be with those that are sick and afflicted. Lord, be with the giver and the ungiver alike as well, dear Heavenly Father, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. in a hurry and y'all know uh, three Sundays and we'll be celebrating Easter it's coming in a hurry the first Sunday in April that's not very far away the way the months is passing it takes about one week and a month is over with already we welcome each and every one of you today we thank you for being here today 
and also we thank the Lord for allowing us to be able to be here today. Uh, in the way of announcements, tonight we will be observing our Lord's Supper with a broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it says on the table to remember, if you have anything to remember about Jesus Christ, it will be tonight. Also, Tuesday night we have our monthly prayer wheel at 7 o'clock, uh, Tuesday I mean, so y'all please be with us if you can, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And then Wednesday is our regular quarterly conference, Wednesday night, for just a few minutes. So I hope that y'all will come and be with us. And next Sunday, the Gideons are supposed to be here. If you want to bring anything for the Gideons, supposed to be here next Sunday in our service. Uh, don't forget to read all of our bulletins. We appreciate uh, all the hard work for these bulletins, so please read it. There's a lot of information in our bulletins. Be in prayer for all on our prayer list. We have a lot of people still sick. I think Brother Buck is the only one we have in the hospital right now, and I think he's supposed to get out tomorrow. Don't know where he's going to go to yet, but I think he's supposed to be out tomorrow. And uh, Carrie Cole is going to go in the hospital for back surgery at 26 this month, so we'll be praying for him and the rest we have on our prayer list. And we need the prayers for everybody, so pray for me. Pray for one another. We all need it. Brother Orville. <clears throat> I feel free to fellowship.
substituted a song this morning. We're going to do Feeling Fine. Y'all sing with us on it. Amen. How many woke up feeling mighty fine this morning? <laughs> Ooh, we've had so much sickness lately, I tell you. Uh, well, I'm just glad I woke up. <laughs> uh, of course, we're going to wake up somewhere anyway, here on the other side. Thank you, oh, Lord Jesus Christ. We appreciate that so much. We really, really do appreciate your presence here this morning. Uh, we know we still have a lot of people that are sick and uh, need to be praying for, but we appreciate the ones that's here and the ones that's able to be here this morning. In Hebrews chapter 9 this morning, uh, out in the foyer as you come in through the foyer, you'll find I had a little uh, replica of the tabernacle, which the youth put that together uh, and they, when they went through study of the tabernacle. And we went through the study of the tabernacle on Wednesday night, but... Uh, I'm going to preach uh, this morning on the tabernacle because that's what happens and uh, to tell us about in chapter 9. So I'm going to give you about three months study in about 30 minutes. So you're going to have to listen real fast 
three-month study. It took us three or four months to go through the study of the tabernacle on Wednesday night, and I know all of you was here and you know all about it, but I wet up your mind. I put a replica of what they had studied out on the foyer. But uh, when I first started reading the Bible, when I first got saved, uh, I was reading the Old Testament, when I got to the tabernacle. And all those measurements and all, I said, what in the world did God put this in the Bible for? All this measurements and all this tabernacle. But as you get to study the Word of God, you find out it's one of the greatest studies that you have in the Bible is a tabernacle because it's all about Jesus Christ and the Christians today. It's just an object lesson of what Christ has done for us. Uh, and what's something that we desperately, desperately need today. And uh, very, very crucial in these verses of scriptures, 1 through 14, the Word of God is going to explain what we really, really need. It's crucial for our need today uh, because people have substituted human reasoning for obedience to the Word of God. Our churches have done this. They have found things that suited people, but it do not suit God. And they have substituted our human reasoning for the obedience of the principle and the word of God in our worship services. Today, something we crucial, crucial need today, and we'll be telling you about this. I'll just read two or three verses of scriptures, if you keep your Bibles open. I hope you have your Bibles with you today. Hebrews chapter 9, and it's going to explain the tabernacle. It says, Then verily the first covenant, had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was the candlesticks and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holies of all. Let us go to the Lord again in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and worship you together. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in a very special way because you promised your word that you would be with us. So we pray that you might hover over us this day and your presence will fill this place today in each and every one of our hearts. Father, if there's someone here today who has never accepted you as Lord and Savior, we pray the day will be the day. Father, to move upon their heart that your name might be glorified in this service today. We thank you and we praise you in your mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I'd like to carry you back now on a journey. Hundreds or maybe thousands of years and maybe thousands of miles this morning to a wilderness in the land of Egypt. And we're going to visit a group of people called the Israelites, normally today called the Jews. Well, you'll ask this question, why? Well, they had the same problem that you and I have today. They had the same problem that the whole world has. And... One of those problems is how in the world am I, myself, a sinful person, going to come into fellowship with the Holy God? Because I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that I have a sin. Does anybody in here realize that you have sinned and you're not perfect? Well, God's perfect and God's holy, and I'm not holy. Well, to start with, that's one of my problems. How am I going to come in contact with the Holy God? How are you going to come in contact with the Holy God? Well, people try a lot of different ways. They try to be good. They even try to come to church. They try to give. They try to do a lot of things. But you see, how are we going to come in contact with the Holy God? Well, he explains it to us how we're going to come in contact with the Holy God, being we know that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it says in the Bible that your sins have separated you from your God. We're separated because we're sinners. His eyes are hidden that he cannot see. Now, only the Jewish people have been given the answer to approach God in this way. All the people of the world at that time, only the Jews, only the Israelites, God chose them and gave them only this way to approach God in the whole wide world. Well, you know, my first problem is, and I seem as them, my sins are separating me from God, and I cannot have fellowship with God. Well, there's another problem. Not only that, I know that I have sinned, and I have a guilty conscience, and it, it worries me. So I have two problems. I know that I'm a sinner. I cannot come in contact with the Holy God, and also my sins 
have left a guilty conscience, stained my conscience. So I have two problems. And what am I going to do with these two problems? How to solve that problem with this nagging, separated from sin? Well, the study in this tabernacle will tell us the Jewish people was give this answer and also an object lesson to show them to show us how to deal with the problem of guilt and separation because of our sin. God chose the Jews. Why God chose the Jews? Because he's God. I wondered a lot of time why God chose those Jewish people. And I finally figured it out because he's God. God chosen people. He chose them to let the whole world understand by God and being their God to them what God can do through his people. And we see in the nation of Israel. Well, the reason we study this why it's so important to understand, as I showed you this uh, replica of that tabernacle, and the reason we study it, the youth has been through it a couple of times, and we've been through it a couple of times. But if you don't have the study, and that's the reason corporate worship and study of the will of God is so important, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, corporate worship. And why we do this, because, you see, the Holy Spirit gives you recall. Now, have you been through this study... Your Holy Spirit of God cannot give you recall for something that's not up there to recall. You must put it up there before anything comes out. But the Holy Spirit will bring it out. Well, we want a journey now to the Sinai, way out into the wilderness, to meet, uh, to meet God and God's people called the Jews. Now, most of the time as we think about this, and if you saw, saw what we went through this study, we're really not prepared for what we find. Because we go back hundreds and thousands of years, and we go back and find out they just got out of Egypt, and we'll be studying that tonight on the, on the Lord's Supper. And uh, they just got out of Egypt, and uh, you, when we find out we see this, or you take an imaginary trip back, it's not just a few people that you understand is there. Estimated at least two and two and a half million people came out of Egypt. That's a large group of people. You all remember that? Now, when we go and meet this group of people and we see that Mount Sinai, we, we find out that they're all living in tents. They lived in tents for 40 years. And when they stopped there at Mount Sinai, God told them to stop. They stopped at Mount Sinai. And all these tents are arranged around one big cube state building that you saw when you walked in the foyer. Now, all of these tents are set up by tribes, 12 tribes of the nation Israel. And all of them are set up by tribes. Now, as you enter in that, you see now in the middle of all these small tents is this big tent called the tabernacle. Now, it's a very unusual building as we see this. And this unusual building has got a white linen fence on the outside called the, uh, you know, the outside wall or we call it outer court. And the inside is very unimpressive. You see that top of that uh, holy of holy was badger skin, very unimpressive building. And it was very, not a large building. It was shaped, you know, kind of uh, oblong. Well, what is this building for? And what, what is it called a tabernacle? I heard about this. Well, this is where that God comes down on earth to meet with his people called the Israelites. Of all the people on the face of this earth, and as big as our earth, God chose one race of people to meet with. And then he chose one small spot that the God of the universe, the creator of everything, came down to meet in a little cube-shaped building called the Holies of Holies. On his place, on his place, and everybody couldn't meet him. We'll find out exactly what happened in just a little while. Now, God come down to meet with his people because they had a problem. And only to the nation Israel. Well, tell me more about this building. Well, that's exactly what chapter 9 of Hebrew have done. You want to know more about it? Well, chapter 9 of Hebrew, 1 through 14, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit of God is explaining to you and I today as we read this book. 
uh, the meaning of this building and why it ought to be so important to every one of us and to your family and to your children to take the study and to make sure you know all about it. Because it said there in verse 1 again, Then verily was the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now, this worldly sanctuary is not where you think about the word worldly like a worldly Christian or what worldly Christian might do. This worldly means something was built on earth. Something that was built on earth. Then it says there in, in verse 9 of this chapter, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of that building, was in the Old Testament called the tabernacle and the temple. Now, we talk about this building now, and it should be very interesting <clears throat> because this building is a representation of something greater and something greater and more perfect, tabernacle, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, verse 9, it says in this chapter, which was a figure for the time then present, that means a parable, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, that is a priest at that time, that did the service perfect or complete as pertaining to the conscience. Talked about the old priest of the Testament, Old Testament now. So as we look at this, Jesus Christ came and being an object lesson of this tabernacle, this object lesson of Jesus Christ coming and what he's done for all of us. And what he's done for us is the same thing what happened in that Old Testament tabernacle. So let's look at this to start with this morning, and let's look at this sanctuary and kind of examine it and see what Jesus Christ has done for us. Well, in that study, we see there's three parts, and we see what we call the tabernacle. And that was the outer court with that white linen fence, as you see that replica out there. And then inside, there's a oblong little small building it's called you know the holy place and then it's got a divider in it it's called the holies of holies now you see if uh, we were Jews we could go into outer court where a white linen fence is at if you was Jews we could go in there because that's where they killed the animals and made the sacrifice you had to go in there with a priest but you see you and I could not go in there because we're we're not Jews I mean we would we could not go we would be outcast. We could not go in. Why? Because you had to be born as a Jew. You know what's wrong with us? We was born the wrong way. That's the reason Jesus Christ said, you must be born again. Every one of us, everybody was born the wrong way. Now, they could go in there because they were Jew, but they could only go into the outer court. All the Jews could go in with their sacrifice, with their priest, into this outer court. But we can't. Now, because, you see, we was born wrong to start with. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what that means, don't you? What is the glory of God? Jesus Christ. Well, you come short of Jesus Christ, sir, ma'am, whoever you are today. Did y'all know y'all have come short of Jesus Christ? Now, we measure up ourselves against other church members. We measure ourselves up against our neighbors, our wife, our husband. We measure our, ourselves up against a lot of people. I'm just as good as they are, this, this, that, and other. But you see, we are not each other's measuring rod. Jesus Christ is. Now, you put yourself up against me, you know what? You might be a lot taller than I am. But you put yourself up against Jesus Christ, and you come short. Every one of us would come short. So, we was born the wrong way. And, you know, we couldn't even go into the outer court. But in the outer court, we see there inside that small part now, there's two rooms. One of the room is called the, the holy place. Now in verse 2, as I've already read, for there was a tabernacle made. That's the tabernacle I'm talking about. The first, wherein was the candlesticks and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary that we're talking about, that little small building. Now, these rooms, you could only imagine, you know, to think about this because your birth kept you out. Now, if you was a Jew, you couldn't go in this building. It's called that tabernacle inside. Only the priest could go in that building. Only the priest. Well, what's in there? Well, one thing it said there in that verse of Scripture is the lampstand. And that lampstand was made out of pure gold. Now, on the outside, the tabernacle looked very unattractive. Nothing really to look at. 
But on inside, it was great. It was different. It was very, very beautiful because it was nothing but gold on the inside. Sparkling gold. And that lampstand, solid gold lampstand. Now, the top of this lampstand, it was a seven arbor lampstand. And on the seven arbor lampstand, there was a cup on each one of these. One of the top, there was a cup. It was a cup of oil, and there was a wick in that cup of olive oil. And that lick was, was lit with a lighter, and it showed a light inside it. Because, you see, if you look at this, there was a cover over that tabernacle when you go out. There was a cover over it. There was no light. There was no way no light could get in the holy place. But this lampstand gave light where the priest could work and do their service in the holy place. Now, if we study this, you think about, uh, I don't know, it was a week or two ago, we studied on the Psalm 23. I know all of you are here on Wednesday night, wasn't you, on Psalm 23? I don't think none of you is missing. But anyway, we studied uh, on, the, on the lamp. And go in there, and the priest would take and cut the wicks off whenever. Y'all remember these old, old lanterns that you had to take and... Uh, uh, had to cut the wicks because they would smoke up and get where they wouldn't burn. Well, the same thing with them. They had to cut them off. And remember I told you it said in the Bible, it says that all these burnt out wicks was taken by the priest with tongs, and then they was put in a snuff can. A snuff can. That's what it's called in the Bible. And not like a snuff can. I mean, you think it's about snuff if people used to dip snuff. But this was a snuff can because it was saved and kept. Remember what I told you what it was about? Because, you see, you and I today, we are lights for Jesus Christ if you're saved. And that shows the work, and you burn out, you see. But everything you do for Jesus Christ is saved. God, do not forget it. But think about why would God, in his word, to put in, that he went in there and trimmed the, trimmed the wicks, the old burnout wicks, then he saved an old burnout wick. What in the word that God is going to do that? Why did he give us that for? To let us know everything you do for Jesus Christ does not go unnoticed. A cup of cold water. Thank you, Lord. Don't y'all wish y'all had some? God always remembers it. You know, to make this service possible this morning, do you know there's been a lot of work put into this service? Bulletins, what's going on right now? Nursery workers, children's church, people looking down upon us up there. There's a lot of work. And some of the time we miss to give people the credit for what they're doing. But God don't forget it. He saves all the work that you've done for him. And he puts it in a snuff can of remembrance. And remembers what we've done for him. He knows all about it. So we see this light. A light in the holy place. Well, why should we be interested in this lampstand and that old building hundreds of thousands of years old? Why should we be interested in, in the word, word of God? Well, if people was interested in the Word of God, it pictures the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. And Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Why should we be interested and why should your family be interested? Because Jesus Christ is the only light that can illuminate a darkened heart. The only light can illuminate an old hard, darkened heart that's full of sin. That's why you and your children ought to be here. That's why we ought to worship the Lord. That's why we ought to be interested in what Jesus Christ done for us, because we have all sinned. And even we find out our precious little children, they come to this world as sinners. Yep, that precious little girl, that precious little boy, even then they come as sinners. We should be interested in that. Why Jesus come? Have you really thought about that? Do you really think about that? To understand this light of this tabernacle, it represents what Jesus Christ has done in your heart, in my heart, if you're saved today, or will do in your heart if you're not saved. Now, there's another room. In this other room, well, on this room, really, there's really the, 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 what we call the table of showbread. I'll get in that table of showbread. Well, in the study of that, you know, this table was made out of pure uh, acacia wood, well, something like mahogany, and uh, it was overlaid with solid gold. And on this little table, those weren't like a loaf of bread that we see in the grocery store, but they was round. There was 12 loaves of bread, 12 round loaves of bread. 
on the show bread, on the show table. Now the priest was only to eat this. They would go in there and the priest would minister in there and they would eat this show bread and they would replace this show bread with another 12 loaves of show bread. But what in the world is this show bread for? What does it represent? Well, to start with, these 12 loaves represents the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel. Well, what does it do for us? Well, Jesus Christ is not only the light of the world, but Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Whew. We feed on the bread of life. Only Jesus Christ can fill a hungry soul by the bread of life. Tonight, we'll be observing what Jesus Christ done for us here on this table, his broken body and his shed blood. Whosoever eats of me shall never hunger again. See, once you get a taste of Jesus Christ, this world will never satisfy you again. In fact, the world won't satisfy you to start with. You just think it will. Now, why people do not want to feed on this bread of life whenever Jesus Christ offers it freely to anybody? But as we move now, we see we move into another inner room. If you see that out on a replica, it's a little cube-shaped room. Exactly cube-shaped, height, width. And it's called the Holies of Holies. The Holies of Holies. Now, this is the second veil. Verse 3 said, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the Holies of All. You see on the outer court, as you see as you go outside, you see there's a linen fence, there's a gate to go in. There's a veil, a gate. It's called a, a gate, a veil. But then you go into, you find this long room there's a, also a veil to start with to go into the holy place. But then there's another veil called the veil that goes into holies of holies. And that holies of holies, you remember whenever Jesus Christ was on the cross of Calvary? And it says, he said, it's finished. And the Bible says the veil in the temple, this is the veil he's talking about, was rent from the top to the bottom meaning that Jesus Christ opened a new and a better way for anybody to go in. Because at that time, at that time, whenever Jesus Christ was on the cross, at that time, you see, there, there was no way to get to God. Only the high priest once a year could go in there to get to God. But Jesus Christ opened it up as we studied Jesus Christ is our high priest, and now we can go to God any time we want to through our high priest, which is Jesus Christ. Now, this holy of holies. Uh, as we see, there's a perfect uh, shaped room. Now, verse 4, and what was in there? Well, it says in verse 4, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with the gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron rod that budded and the table of the covenant. Now, that was in the cube shaped room, what's called the holies of holies. Well, what was all that about? Well, there was a golden censer. That was a, a golden pan, like a pan. And, you, and this golden pan, you know, all it was was a pan that held coals, hot coals of fire. And the priest would go in there with the hot coals of fire and they'd carry the incense in there and sprinkle on there and a smoke would fill up a sweet flavor to the Lord, would fill up that cube-shaped room, would just be a sweet smell to God. And what has that got to do with us? What in the world, when the priests go in there, only the high priests go in there, what would that be? Well, we find out that that's our prayers. That's our prayers. Whenever you pray, you know what? It goes through the holies of holies. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in the holies of holies, carries our prayers right to the throne room of God. Right to the throne room of God. So we thank the Lord so much for that. And all this light that God gives us. Well, we're in that cube-shaped room now with a high priest. And uh, we think about this high priest. Uh, he goes in there, the high priest. Now, what are we going to find? Well, we find this golden censer and our prayers offered up. And uh, Jesus Christ today is the right hand of God doing that, making intercession for us. Every time we pray, did you know your prayers got to go through Jesus Christ? Your prayers has to go through Jesus Christ. That means if you're not saved, you can't pray to a holy God. Because Jesus Christ is your way to approach a holy God. 
And without Jesus Christ, you can't approach a holy God, even in your prayers. But not only do your prayers go through Jesus Christ, but he's praying for you, the Bible says. He's praying for you. Now, as we see this, God gives us a great view of what God is doing for us. So what else is in there? Well, next is the Ark of the Covenant. It's a chest, the Ark of Covenant. It's a chest made out of acacia wood, overlaid with a solid gold is on the in, inside. Well, what's on the inside of that chest? Well, there's three articles on the inside of that chest. One article is a golden pot of manna. Well, what's that got to do with me, a golden pot of manna? Well, you remember the children of Israel? They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness because they disobeyed God. They wouldn't go into the promised land. When they told them to go into the promised land, they wandered for 40 years. And all the people that come out of Egypt, all the Jews, all the Israelites, every one of them died from 20 years old and older because they would not obey God. And that's exactly what's going to happen to a lot of Christians today. They're going to die in the wilderness because they will not obey God. Now, it don't mean they're not going to heaven. But they're going to die in the wilderness because they will not accept what God has laid out in his word. Well, they die in the wilderness. Well, in my 40 years, although they stayed out there for 40 years, they all died, but they had to have something to eat. Well, guess who fed them? God Almighty. Well, how did he feed them? Every morning, he had rained down angel food cake. Every morning. And they would gather every morning, they'd gather that manna. But now you couldn't gather enough to last you two days. You had to gather it one day at a time. Because if you gather it, try to get enough for the next day, it will spoil. God wants you to have service every day for him, not just once in a while. But this represented this manna, this pot of manna represented what God has done. He sustained them and gave them and reminded them of the food that he took care of them. You see, that's what this is on the table we had the night, Lord, he says, remember what I've done for you. This was the same thing with the manna, that I fed you in the wilderness. I'm the one that done this. You know it said that their clothes did not wear out? I mean, God supported them more than just one way like he does us today, and we just don't realize. You know what's wrong with our country this day and time? We don't need God. We don't need God. We've gone crazy in this country Look at the politics of our country now. You can see one side, the other side. It's strictly people don't believe in God. And they won't want God. They want to change everything about God. They want God out of our country. They want God out of our churches. And they asked about God in a lot of churches today. God's not in a lot of churches today. And they're getting fewer all the time. It represents God. And we're right close of Jesus Christ coming back, whether y'all believe it or not. How close is that? I don't know, but we're a day closer today than it was yesterday. I can tell you that. All right, this golden manna. But what else was in there? Aaron's rod that budded. Now, what in the world is Aaron's rod that budded? With an old dry stick. You know, most of it was kind of like shepherding out a stick and a staff, you know, they walked along with, you know, to kill snakes, whatever they want to use it for. Uh, but what in the world is Aaron's rod? We find out it's in that, it's in that, uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant. Well, what is that all about? Well, the people of Israel, believe it or not, God chosen people rebelled against God. And they rebelled against Aaron. Who is he to tell us what to do? Who is Aaron to be telling us what to do? Who put him there as priest? God says, all right, I'll show you. So he said, every one of the tribe of the nation of Israel, they 12 tribes, you get me 12 leaders. And every one of them bring their staff. It's all in the Bible. Every one of them bring their staff, an old dead stick, put it in that camp of the covenant, and the next morning, whichever one that buds and blossoms and blooms will be the high priest tribe. Just guess who was a high priest tribe. Just guess which one of those staff that budded. Aaron's. Aaron's. There, God said, I showed you and I told you. You want to do it your way? You're not going to do it your way. You're going to do it God's way. He's going to get the last word in our life. He's going to get the last word in your family. And he's going to get the last word in our country. He's going to get the last word. Well, we have that. We have the, 
the uh, Aaron's rod that budded. What is that in? Well, that's a picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God brought life out of a dead stick. You know, that's what it done for me. You weren't nothing but just a dead stick. That's all any of us was, just a dead stick. The wages of sin is death. You know what? God gave me a gift. That was eternal life through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, you're dead in trespasses and sin. Aaron Rod that budded. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, verse 4 said there was something else. There was a, there was a table of covenants. What in the world is that all about? Well, this table of covenants said in verse 5, and, overlaid the, and, and over it was the cherubims of glory, shattering the mercy seat, of which we can now speak particular, looking down upon the mercy seat. Two golden angels looking down of the mercy seat. Well, what was the table of the covenants? The Ten Commandments that God gave Moses and went on Mount Sinai. The laws of God was given to God's people called the Israelites, the Jew. He was, did not give them to all the nations of the world, he gave them to the Jews. To live their life, a holy life, that all the nations of the world will see what God has done through that nation Israel, and they say, I want, I want that God that you got. Because, you see, there was a lot of gods. There are about as many gods then we have today in the United States because there's a lot of gods today, and Jesus Christ is not first place in a lot of people's lives today, even Christians today. Worldly things are, and worldly gods are. But, you see, God said, I want this nation and he got a, look what he'd done for nation Israel. You'd think, and so many times I thought about this, you know, if I was a nation Israel and what God had done for the nation Israel, I'd think I would behave myself and obey God a lot better than what they did. No, you wouldn't. God done just as much for us and more than what he's ever done for nation Israel, and we don't behave ourselves, and we don't obey God either. No, we know better. That's the reason Jesus Christ came. Because we're not no better. Now these, we find out what's in there. Why should it interest us? Because, see, God knows we have three basic needs as human beings. We have a physical need, we have a spiritual need, and we have moral needs. Well, inside that covenant, God made provision to meet all three of these needs in our life. He gave our physical need because a pot of manna that we feed on with it. You know, Jesus Christ said, you know, the bread of life. We need this manna to sustain us every day. I mean, we need, Lord, give us our, our bread, our daily bread. We've got to have something to eat to sustain us. Well, God makes sure that you do. You know, God has made sure that all of us had plenty to eat. Did you all know that? You think it's because you worked harder? God has just given it to you. What have you got that God has not given to you? What have you got that God has not given to you? Your wealth, your health, everything. God give it to you. You think you deserve it? You know what you deserve, don't you? Does anybody want what they deserve? I don't. But he takes care of that, and this is the manna. He rains it down every day upon us, our physical needs. Every day he feeds us. Well, the second thing that takes care of my physical need, but you see, there's a spiritual need that I have. How did it take care of that? Well, inside that ark of that covenant is Aaron's rod that budded, representing Jesus Christ. You see, that takes care of my spiritual needs. I have a spiritual need with God. Well, Aaron rod that budded, it takes care of that because that represents Jesus Christ. Every spiritual need I have, Jesus Christ has met. Every one. Well, there leaves one more. There leaves the moral needs. And here's where we have fell short in our country, our families, and also in our churches, our moral needs. Because those moral needs was a table of stone, God's law. And we have done away or tried to do away with God's law in our churches, in our families, and also in our nation. But these table of stones, God give them to us or give them to the nation of Israel to live God's way. They didn't know how to live either. But God gave them the stones and wrote with his finger, you know, the moral issues that they need to go by. 
God give that to the nation of Israel. God has given us by the word of God. I seen on television, one of, I believe it was last night, me and George were watching television on the news a little bit, and this, I don't think it was a water's world. This lady come on there and said, you know, we don't supposed to say man no more. Or man, you want to do away with man. Or man, don't let that in our vocabulary today. No, no more man. You know, a he and a she and a she and a he and a he, she and a he, she, you don't know what she is. And I think we ought to accept this. God's got a law. A moral law. God gives them to this church and through the word of God. God gives principle to the church. And I tell you, you know, a lot of people, they want to satisfy the people and they don't want to satisfy God. That's the reason churches are changing so because the people likes it. Well, God don't. God's got a law and God's got principles and you won't get around it. Just because people likes it don't mean that God likes it. But our moral needs are given to us inward. Our personal relationship with Jesus Christ takes care of all of our needs, all three of them, in that covenant. Well, let's examine now. We looked at the sanctuary a little while. Now let's see the service that goes on in this sanctuary. Verse 6 now, it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle. Now, remember, they go into the first part of it according to the service of God. Okay, it says the priest. You see that plural in that verse of Scripture? The priest. Well, there was a lot of work doing. It says always, every day, every day, every day, every day, and every day, every day, they went in that work. In the first room, every day, they trim, you know, the, the wicks. They make sure the showed bread was on there. Now, that was a lot of hard work. The, the priests, there was a lot of them. They go into the first room. They had a lot of work to do. Now, the priests, according to Jewish history, and the Jewish, even today, you know, a priest could be a priest for uh, 25 years. They started at the age of 25. They went to 50. And then it was released of their duty of, of being a priest because that was a lot of hard work. Now, can you imagine getting up and killing an animal every day? All day long, all day long, kill an animal all day long, all day long, all day long, every day for 25 years. Other priests had other jobs. It was a lot of hard work being a priest, generation after generation. That's what then priest. They went in that first room, priest. They had a lot of work to do. But now the second room is a holy of holies I've just got through telling you about. Verse 7. But into the second, they talk about the second room. When the high priest singular, one man, alone, once, every year, but not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the era of the people. Only one, singular, one man, once a year. This was called once a year when they went in there. The Jews had a day called the Day of Atonement. We represent that tonight when we have the Lord's Supper, the Day of Atonement. When the high priest, once a year, would go and they killed, you know, the scapegoat. There was two goats. And they'd bring a goat up there, and the high priest would examine them, and he'd kill one and cut his throat and kiss the blood. And other, you know, he'd put his hands on the next goat, and he'd put his hand on that, and he'd, you know, ask forgiveness for himself, and then also for the whole nation. And they'd carry that goat out into the wilderness, and they'd turn him loose in the wilderness, never be seen no more. That would call, you know what, the Day of Atonement. Same thing for our sin. He said, I'll remember your sins no more. I put him as far as the east is from the west. That's what he done for us. That's what it represents. But that day, called the Day of Atonement, that special, special day, he then he took the blood of that animal that was killed, and he went in the Holy of Holies. He went in there and sprinkled that blood on that mercy seat. Now, all that done was covered their sin and rolled over one more year to Calvary. Next year, had to do it again. One more year to Calvary. It never, the Bible says, it never took away sin. It just covered sin for one more year. All the Old Testament just covered sin for one more year. Then whenever John was baptizing, Jesus Christ comes down to be baptized by John. Behold, the Lamb of God done what? Does what? Takes away sin of the world. Not covers them, 
There's a difference between covering and taking away. Takes away sin of the world. Well, early in the morning now, the high priest, he'd get up. You know, he'd make all those sacrifices, you know. And you know what? He'd go in that brazing altar, that brazing altar. You know, where there's fire going. Then he'd wash his hand in that brazing laver. And then he'd put on that beautiful, beautiful robe, garment. And they go into the high, high, uh, holy place. With that smoke of the incense, it filled that room up. And then you know what? He'd take that blood and go into the holies of holies, sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat, and he'd get out of there. He wouldn't say a word. He'd get out of there. The mercy seat. What in the world is that? What does that mean to us in that tabernacle? What does that mercy seat, as you see it in that tabernacle, what does that mean to us? Well, you see, we've got a mercy seat, too, in the New Testament. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and 25 says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. You see that word perpetuation? That's the same word for covering. The same thing that the priest done that day, but Jesus Christ took our sin away. 1 John 2 and 2 said Jesus Christ did a perpetuation not for our sins only, but for sin for the whole world. Jesus Christ is. He is our covering for sin. You know why? Because you see, whenever I have sinned, God don't see my sin. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad of that? Whew. But it says there in verse 8 now, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holies of all was not yet made. Not in the Old Testament, it wasn't yet made. What made? While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, as that Old Testament tabernacle and the temple was standing, a way the holy of the holy was not made yet while it was standing in the Old Testament. What in the world? Signifying, that means showing while this tabernacle was on earth, it was limited. Man could only go so far. Then verse 9 says, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered gifts and sacrifices could not make him that did the service perfect or complete as pertaining to the conscience. Well, the Jews had a problem, as we all had. They had these ceremonial, all they done was ceremony, all this outward ceremony that we had, killing all those animals, everything they'd done. You know what? It was outward. You know what the problem with that old one was? Because it couldn't get on the inside. You know where your problem is at today? It's on inside your heart. You get your heart right, you know what? You won't have no worry with the rest of the problems. It's on the inside. Our problem, you see, the Lord settled that problem if you'll take it the night of the Lord's Supper. That's what it's all about. He gets on the inside do what the ceremonies could not do. Well, let's look at exalted Lord there in verse 11. All these ceremonies, then it says in verse 11, Take a big breath because it says, but Christ. But Christ, being come as a high priest of good things to come by a greater and a perfect tabernacle, that's himself, not made with hands, that is to say, not of that old building. Now, but Christ, what we have, what Christ done for us, his broken body and his shed blood. Jesus solved the two problems that I have, the two problems that I'm unholy. The problem, you know, that I'm a sinful, and my sins have separated me from a holy God. Well, Jesus Christ comes in, and he settles that first problem. Because he takes me by one hand, he takes God by the other hand, and he's on the cross. And he brings us together, me and a holy sinner. I mean, a, a sinner and a holy God, he brings us together, you. That's what he's done for you. But not only that, he takes away my guilty conscience. Because I know that I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation, and not what I do and what I don't do, but for what Jesus Christ does. Now, that solved that problem. Now, the problem, you know, that really that alienates us, as we say from a holy God, it says there in verse 12, neither by the blood of goats nor calves, but by his own blood. You see, all the goats and calves did not do it, could not do it, but by his own blood. What happened? He entered in once, not every year. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained a what? An eternal redemption for us. That means forever and forever. Eternal means forever and forever. Not just one time and it's all over with. It's ever, forever, and forever, forever. Eternal payment for our sins. The blood of animals could not do this. Then a problem, you know what? With my conscience, verse 13. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to purify of the flesh, if that. If the blood of animals could have done that, Jesus Christ would not have come. If these old, sac- old animal sacrifices, what we have in the tabernacle, if they could have cleansed sin, Jesus Christ would not have come. But they would not do it. They couldn't do it. God did not accept the blood of animals to clean the sin just to cover it for one more year's pointing to Calvary. Whenever Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden, they sinned. You remember what they tried to do? The same thing a lot of people try to do. They, they try to cover themselves with worldly things. Fig leaves was the first religion of the world. Fig leaves. People still trying to do that. They come in and sit here in this auditorium a lot of times and they'll probably try to cover their sins with their fig leaves. But God said he wouldn't accept it. You know what God done? He had to kill animals. He covered them with skins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Right there in the edge of the Garden of Eden, the first human beings on this earth, Adam and Eve, by God slaying those animals, pointing to the cross of Calvary many hundred years in the future. And that's what all these Old Testament rituals are all about, pointing to Jesus Christ, what he'd done for us. Now, the root of the problem, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purged our conscience. There it is. There's my second problem. Our conscience from dead works who serve a living God. You see, if you save, you're called to serve. You're called to serve. Much more. You know, we all had those problems. Thank you, Lord, that he allowed us to see what he gave to the Jews, he's given us a better way through Jesus Christ. Everybody is saved now with the, just like the Jews back then pointed to the cross. We Now we look back to the cross, what Christ has already done for us. Now, if you're here today, you try to cover your sins, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. You know, you've got to accept Jesus Christ because there's our only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, it's not through a local church neither. It's not through a local church. It's not through church membership because there's a lot of people on church membership that's not going to heaven. And a lot of them on Baptist churches are not going to heaven. They may be some that plays a hill that's not going to heaven because church membership will not get you into heaven. But you've got to have a relation with Jesus Christ and not just knowing about Jesus Christ. Everybody in here knows about Jesus Christ. I wonder if anybody in here is lost today. Have you confessed your sins to Jesus Christ? You said, yeah, I've done that. Well, have you followed him through baptism? Now, you need a church home, and you need to join a local church. And you need to follow him through baptism, if you say, because you're telling the world what has happened already in my heart. I want to show you what's happened by following Jesus Christ through baptism and coming to a local church. But you're saved before. You're saved before you go into that water. You're just expressing what you've, what's already happened in here. Uh, if you're saved, you know what? Why would people be ashamed, be ashamed of what Jesus Christ has done for them? Why wouldn't they walk down a church aisle and accept Jesus Christ? Look what he's done for them. You're a sinner. You can't come in contact with the Holy God. Only through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. The only way to God. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus Christ says. So today, if God has spoke to you, you come here today not really knowing why you come. You've never made this confession of faith. You need to make it today. Because what God has done, he solved your two basic problems of life. What I've just told you about, if you just accept what he's done for you. But you see, if you don't accept it, it's null and void. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood. You know what? It's null and void if you don't accept what he's done for you. I don't think God would send me to hell if I have never killed nobody. I ain't never done this. I ain't never done that. I don't think God would send me to hell. God never sends nobody to hell. Nobody. God never sends nobody to hell. You go into hell as an intruder because you've got to step over the blood of Jesus Christ. Hell was made not for mankind but for the devil and his angels called demons. 
God don't send anybody. God give you a free will to accept his gift he's offering you this morning in Christ Jesus. Would you accept that gift? Well, I might one day. Well, one day it might be too late. The day's the day of salvation according to Jesus Christ. As we come to the song of invitation, we're going to give you an opportunity to do what God has called you to do. The greatest, most important thing on the face of this earth is fixing to happen right now. All heaven is looking down upon this gathering of this group of people right now. The Holy Spirit of God knows every heart in this building. He knows exactly what you're thinking, what you feel, and what you believe. He knows also what you're willing to do in obedience to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Are you willing to accept what Jesus Christ done for you? It's all in the book. Just believe it. It's going to be your opportunity to come to Jesus Christ. It's all up to you. God has done everything he can. He gave his only son to die on the cross for this invitation that we're given right now. To make it possible for you to be saved. You love your children. Let me tell you, mothers. Let me tell you, fathers. The greatest gift that you can give to your children is a Christian mother and father. Listen to me, children. Everyone in here is age of accountability and older. Listen to me, children. The greatest gift that you can give to your mother and father is a Christian boy or girl. It's all up to you. No greater gift than a gift of salvation called Christianity. As we stand and sing this song, it's up to you. All of Jesus Christ, I surrender. God bless you. Thank you for your service today or coming to this service. I hope you come back tonight and let's celebrate the Lord's Supper, what he's done for each and every one of us. And to tie this message today together as for what Jesus Christ done on Calvary's cross. Thank you. We praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Brother Joe Chance, do you mind giving us a benediction, please?